Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, June 25th. It's been a hot week, a hot week and a half here in the Annapolis area. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about leadership. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Okay, my guests today are the winners of the 2023 Naval Institute Leadership Contest. This contest runs every year with the deadline in the late fall, and we publish the winners in the spring and summer of the following year. The contest is sponsored by Drs. Jack and Jennifer London Charitable Foundation. Uh, they, they sponsor it every year. We thank them. And this year, the winners were all Coast Guard officers, and, and two of the three are able to join me today. So uh, first up was uh, the first prize winner was Coast Guard Lieutenant Matthew Nagel. His essay was titled Follow Your Gut. It was published in the May 2024 issue of Proceedings. Uh, second prize went to Coast Guard Lieutenant Nick Jabs. His essay was titled Don't Run Faster Than Your Crew. It appeared in the June issue, so the current issue. Uh, Nick, unfortunately, could not join us today. And Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander Drew Stafford took third prize with Empower the Mid-Level Leader, which is coming in the July issue. So we've already put that issue to bed. It's off at the printers and should be on its way to your uh, to your mailbox, and it'll be posted uh, on Sunday, this coming Sunday. So, gentlemen, thanks for writing for Proceedings and coming on the show. Uh, let's take a minute and do intros. Um, so I'll start with Drew. Where'd you go to school? What's your specialty in the Coast Guard, and where are you currently stationed? Uh, thanks, Bill. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Lieutenant Commander Drew Stafford. Uh, I went to school for mechanical engineering at the United States Coast Guard Academy. Uh, currently, I'm the commanding officer of Coast Guard Cutter Alder, stationed out of uh, San Francisco, California, uh, and we're primarily primarily responsible for servicing aids to navigation, uh, but we do also some law enforcement, some international engagements uh, throughout uh, South and Central America. Thank you. So, uh, um, Drew, your, your cutter is one of the uh, black-hulled Coast Guard cutters, not one of the white hulls, right? That's correct. Uh, I've been on a few different platforms, but currently uh, my last two cutters have both been 225-foot uh, buoy tenders, uh, which is which is a black hole in the black hole fleet. Cool. Okay, and now uh, Lieutenant Matt Nagel, uh, give us a, a quick intro on who you are. Morning, and thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I also, like uh, Lieutenant Commander Stafford, I was a Coast Guard Academy graduate. I was a government major, class of 2019, and I've been on ships for the last five years. I'm finishing up my tour on uh, Coast Guard Cutter Turn just down the pier from uh, Lieutenant Commander Stafford, also in San Francisco, uh, this Friday. So I'm coming towards the end of uh, a great run being on uh, Coast Guard Cutters, and I'll be headed to uh, law school for my next assignment to train to be a Coast Guard lawyer. And TURN is a, um, an 87-foot patrol boat. And what are your main missions? Our main missions are search and rescue, maritime law enforcement, and living marine resources enforcement. And we moved the time of today's uh, podcast around a little bit because you guys are getting underway later this, uh, this morning. I guess it's morning for you and probably early okay. afternoon in the, uh, in the D.C. time, time frame. That's exactly right. We're going to go try and get offshore and do some weapons training today, hopefully if the weather cooperates with us. Nice, nice. All right. Well, um, let's get into the uh, the details of the articles, and uh, I'll start by just saying um, we we have uh, something called the leadership forum in every issue of proceedings. Uh, we we that is a conscious choice that we've made for probably decades now, because the topic of leadership is eternally important. Um, and some people will often say, oh, yeah, leadership, I got that. I went through, you know, school and and I've taken my mandatory leadership, um, you know, courses and that sort of thing. But really, it's a very personal, um, it's a personal thing. It's something that um, everybody has to constantly, I, I think, change and modulate and learn their leadership style and how they apply it with different people on different teams. And it's always good to hear how other people are either excelling at leadership, 
struggling with leadership or what they've learned. So, I, you know, we at Proceedings have made this a, a conscious choice uh, and we've made it a conscious choice to have this essay contest uh, every year, which, by the way, is open to uh, ensigns and uh, second lieutenants in the, in the Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard, uh, all the way up to lieutenant commanders and majors. So 01 to 04 is the uh, is the wheelhouse for this uh, essay contest. So, Matt, your essay was titled Follow Your Gut, question mark. Uh, why the question mark in the title? Well, I was addressing some issues of real uncertainty. Um, what, what motivated me to write this was a search and rescue case that we ran in May of 2023, so a little over a year ago. Uh, it was about 70 nautical miles off the coast of California. It was a really challenging case. The, the weather really uh, was a challenge for us. We were battling some pretty intense seasons, some pretty intense winds. Uh, for about 12 hours as we made our way out to uh, this sailing vessel that was in distress. It had their mast snap off in a storm uh, the evening before, and they were just adrift uh, and in need of saving. So we battled to get out there, and, and finally, once we got on scene, right as the sun was starting to set, we passed the tow line over to them and took them in tow. And there was a moment where I remembered thinking to myself that for so many mariners, the difference between life and death is a tow line connected to the U.S. Coast Guard. And then our tow line broke and they were adrift again. And I felt really afraid, nervous. I was scared uh, that the folks that we were charged with saving were now in peril again. And it was going to be our responsibility to figure out a way to get them home safe. And uh, what really occurred to me as I searched my feelings for what to do next was that I should call my boss, that I should pick up the sat phone and call for help, which is a, such a horrible idea. We had everything that we needed in order to handle this case successfully. I had a, a functional cutter and a trained crew, and that's what we did. We repaired our tow line and we were able to get those mariners back safely. But when I got back to the pier, uh, it, it wasn't enough that we just did the mission uh, successfully. I needed to, to explore those feelings. You know, when you're at sea, you trust your instincts uh, with your life and with the life of your crew. And I felt like my instincts were leading me astray. I felt like my gut was telling me to do something that I knew not to do. So I picked up the pen and started writing. And I developed a leadership framework that was uh, designed to help translate and understand those feelings of discomfort, especially for junior leaders, uh, into different ways of thinking where uh, understanding what is your responsibility to handle in your capacity of, of whatever job that you're in and when you might be in over your head and actually in need of calling for support from the chain of command for alignment, for guidance, for advice, whatever it may be. Uh, the goal of what I was writing was hopefully that it can be uh, used by future leaders when they're in a, a challenging spot like I was to, to just understand and analyze the um, the extent of what they are really capable of. And I think we're all in our own ways uh, and in our own leadership capacities capable of a lot more than we initially uh, might think. And, and it's that empowerment that I think sets the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. military apart in the way that we empower our leaders. Uh, that's a great story. It, it takes courage, I think, to uh, uh, particularly to be a commanding officer, to be a young commanding officer and to um, doubt yourself and then to uh, to delve into and, and uh, you know, go into depth with those feelings and think, geez, you know, was I right or wrong to make the call, not make the call? Uh, I, so I, I, I applaud you for just having the courage to kind of explore that after the fact. Like you got through it. I think a lot of people would say, Whew, OK, let's move on to the next one. I don't want to go there. Right. But you instead you dropped anchor for for a bit. You wrote about it. Um, and then you learn from it and you, you shared a, uh, as you said, a rubric for leadership of you know, making hard decisions in those kinds of uh, hard situations. Uh, we'll come back to you in a bit, in a, in a minute there, Matt, but I want to go to Drew for a minute. Uh, so Drew, your article is, uh, is about empowering mid-level leaders. And so this looks at, a, um, it, you know, I think an important and often perhaps overlooked uh, aspect of leadership. We think about you know, those at the top of the food chain, we think about the commanding officers, we talk, you know, think about maybe on the enlisted side, the command master chief or the chief in the division. Um, 
but but there's a whole you know in between being a division officer and being a CEO, uh, or in between being a you know a young petty officer and being a master chief, you know there's a whole uh, slice of of leaders, right? And and their impact is it can be incredibly important. In some in some ways, uh, it either it either um, um, uh, magnifies um, you, you know the good leadership at the top, or it can or it can slow down and and uh, uh, and create problems for the good leadership at the top. You know, getting to the de deck plate. So so tell us about the experiences that you um, that you had that led you to write the article, and then you know some of your insights. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, no, so before before my current job, I was the executive officer of Coast Guard Cutter Juniper uh, out of Honolulu, Hawaii, and it was, it was a fantastic tour. Um, during that time, I was very fortunate to just have a phenomenal group of people on board that ship. Uh, things ran well. I mean, all, all ships uh, run into their issues, but for the most part, like, just very fortunate to have a great group of people. Things were running well. Programs were were put together well, we were operating well. And uh, the commanding officer at the time was is a, is a great mentor uh, of mine. And, and we had uh, many conversations about like, why, why is this ship running well? Like, what is this, this special thing we have going on here? Like what's happening? And I think a lot of that boiled down to the quality of leaders we had at that E5, E6 level, and then the ensigns coming in, um, just really taking ownership of their programs, really leading, taking pride in what they're doing. Um, and so we went into a lot with that about like, what what is making these people good leaders and why is that affecting the, the ship in the way it is? Um, and I think you, you spoke to it very well before. Um, you know, throughout the military, we have this this vision of what a what a leader is, what a commanding officer is, what the chief of the boat or the 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 different these leadership figureheads are. But we often overlook the people that are leading day to day tasks. Uh, those people that are leading day to day tasks are are interacting with so many more people uh, because they're briefing up the chain of command. They're leading tasks down the chain of command. Um, so if those people can have a good attitude, if those people are good leaders, um, then just in general, the boat is going to run better. The ship is going to function better. Um, if all of those people take ownership in the climate on board the boat and people's well-being on board the boat, um, then you have a whole lot more people looking out for each other, a whole lot more people taking ownership um, in how the boat operates, in how people are doing. Um, and it, it's it spreads that ownership around and really just creates a, so a very good atmosphere on board. Um, and I, I think that's important. I think that's often overlooked is, is the development we put into our junior folks in the leadership aspect. Everything is so focused on their technical ability, which, which is vitally important. Uh, but if we want to grow future leaders, uh, we have to start with the growth process and, and make them, uh, you know, positive mid-level leaders to start with. One of the examples, uh, Drew, that that jumped out at me, and it, it was a little one, or it's a small little thing in your article, but you you gave the example of uh, you know a, a petty officer is asking an ensign or a JG a question about you know geez it's it's sort of the grumbling like uh, why do we have to get underway again today you know Matt you might be facing this today <laughs> um, and and you know the ensign can answer that with ah I don't know um, you know, this, this stinks. I, I, I don't understand what we're doing. Or, you know, you gave the example of him answering it in, in a much more positive way. So just take that a little bit further. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's an important thing that's, that's often overlooked by especially junior leaders is that their words matter. Like what you say, how you interact with people on a daily basis really does affect everybody. Um, and especially the, the junior people that are looking to, to those leaders for, for answers. Um, so, so an example there is, and a seemingly innocent example, you know, in passing, if, if somebody, you know, junior enlisted member asks an ensign, uh, even if it's a brand new ensign, like, hey, why are we doing this task? Why are we getting underway? You know, uh, I thought we were gonna be able to have the day off or something like that. And if that ensign answers like, oh, I, have, I don't know, like I wasn't involved in those decisions, while that sounds harmless um, and is probably not a, a, a big deal, 
of, you know, what is that doing? That's one kind of validating the feelings that that person is having, you know, getting underway. Um, and, and it's also kind of isolating command as, a, as this en entity that is not involving everybody in the decision, which, you know, may be true, may not be true. But, but if, that, if that ensign is a strong, you know, mid-level leader and they answer, even if they don't have all the, the answers, you know, us as leaders don't always have all the answers to everything, but they can answer that in a variety of ways. Um, the, that ensign is probably privy to like long-term work schedules, probably probably understands um, what the patrol schedule looks like, inspections that are coming up. So that can be, that can, if we change the wording there a little bit and just say, well, we probably have an inspection, we have this inspection coming up. Um, so we need an extra work day to make sure that we're prepped for that. Or we have a long patrol coming up. So doing a little extra prep work ahead of time is going to make it easier for us in the long run. Um, that does a couple things in the leadership realm. One that gives that junior enlisted person a sense of purpose, like, hey, why are we doing this? And then it also gives shows that that ensign is giving an answer um, and is is um, stepping into a leadership role instead of deferring that leadership answer. Um, and it also creates a more unified command structure. So even even if that person wasn't privy to the exact answers for that workday, um, it, it shows that they're at least paying attention and, and have a, um, an understanding of what's happening on the ship and that, that creates a better leadership um, structure in general, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. I, I like the way you said that, uh, you know, rather than sort of isolating the command structure in, instead of the ensign saying, uh, I don't know, you know, the skipper just says we got to do this or something like that, you know, by by having the answer or at least having a partial answer and sharing, you know, what what he or she knows, then then they're connecting, you know, the, the entire command. Right. It's not it's not like, oh, those guys up there, you know, you know, they're making the decisions and we just have to get underway and. You know, it's no, no, no. Here's why we're doing it. You know, have you looked at the long term schedule or did you, you know, you know, next week we got this inspection coming up. So we got to get ready for that. And, you know, and that that's that's a it's a, a little thing, but it can be a night and day sort of um, differentiator. I think you make a very good point there. Um, Matt, back to you for a second. I wanted to ask, uh, you know, so you in, in a moment of, uh, you know, a, a, a fraught moment, right? You're at sea. Um, you got some civilian mariners that uh, whose lives are on the line. Your your towing line parts. You're in rough rough weather. It's nighttime. The situation's kind of uh, you know going south pretty quickly. And you contemplate you know should I call my boss and ask for advice or you know and you and then you decide not to. Did you? I wanted to ask who who is your you know immediate superior in command. So who would you have called and did you talk to him or her after? Well, the, the person that I had in mind was uh, a great mentor of mine is uh, Commander Dave Herndon. He's our chief of enforcement at Sector San Francisco. And he's, he's such a great sounding board. He's someone that I'm usually not shy about bouncing ideas off of and uh, speaking with very candidly. He's been uh, a great resource and a great mentor over my two years. But the reason why I, I really wanted to own that leadership decision and, and why I was proud of myself for doing it was because there really wasn't even a leadership decision to make. Our standard procedure when something uh, breaks like that is to find a repair or if we can't make a repair, have one flown out to us by our friends over at Air Station Sacramento who were, were standing by ready to, to take care of us if we needed to. The, there was a whole network of people that were there to support me and all I needed to do was fill my role. I was nervous. It was intense, but yep. there was no real need for me to feel that negative emotion. When I, when I drew up my little uh, diagram, I was in the, the performance dimension, which is where you're following clear policy or pre-mission planning. And even though it's a, a really intense or, or uh, important decision that you have to make, your decisions really are tightly and narrowly guided by all of the different things that you've done to prepare for that mission. As yeah, opposed you got, to you got SOPs and checklists and, you know, you've, you've trained for it. And so like, you know, fo follow the checklist, right? Or as my aviator friends would say, follow the bold face. 
<laughs> exactly. And and in that moment, that's that's what ultimately we did. We uh, we repaired our tow line. I remember I was sitting uh, up on the bridge after after our tow line had been repaired. We passed it for a second time, and uh, my my uh, operations petty officer was sitting next to me. And I said, BM1, wow, you really spliced the eyes of those uh, lines on the tow bridle back together really quickly. How did you manage to do that? That's usually a pretty timely process to repair a line like that. And he said, looked at me and said, uh, well, almost, Captain, uh, two Bolins. <laughs> we were we were towing them with uh, with two temporary bites in the line, but it worked and it was uh, worked, worked uh, to get the mission done. And it was the the right thing to do at the time. And, and we were, were never in jeopardy of doing anything else. It was a, uh, a situation that was frightening, but one where I didn't need to feel the level of discomfort that I felt because we were just performing. We were doing uh, the mission as we were trained to do it. And I think so often, uh, especially young leaders, find themselves in that position where there's a, a, a frightening and intense moment, but really, all that we're doing is just following our well-written, carefully crafted procedures. Got it. Uh, talk for a second, because I, I know you get into it in your article. You've got sort of a quad chart of when, you know, when to call. Right. So in this case, you you had procedures, you had, uh, you know, an SOP um, and you made the decision like, no, no, I, I can handle this. We can handle this. My crew can handle it. We know what to do. Um, but you also talk in the article about you know, when you're in a different part of that quad chart and when things are uncertain and perhaps there aren't, uh, you know, good SOPs for it, perhaps uh, it takes a little bit more um, judgment rather than just execution. Uh, you know, give us an example or two of those kinds of decisions and, and you're thinking about, you know, what, how, how you might face either, either you have faced them or maybe how you might face them if you haven't faced one yet. Sure, absolutely. So I talked a little bit about uh, the performance dimension, which if you can picture uh, a quad chart on our, um, hor our horizontal axis is the level of uh, discomfort that you feel. Discomfort's a proxy for uh, how clear the policy guidance or pre-mission planning is from a scale of uh, plus where you've got uh, unclear guidance, something that's not covered by policy or on the minus side where something's really clear by a checklist or a, a TTP, SOP, something like that. And then on the vertical axis, the, the up and down axis is uh, how uh, important the decision is, a high yield decision versus something that's a low yield decision. Uh, so a very clear cut low yield decision in the bottom left-hand corner of the quadrant is something that I call the followership zone. That's like a routine administrative or a personnel decision, something that we make every day. And what I pointed out in that quadrant when you're making a leadership decision is that that is one where there's never any room for uh, deviation. It's something that we should seek total alignment in because it's low yield and it's clearly articulated. The flip side of that, the bottom right quadrant, quadrant is low yield and not specified by policy. Some examples that I threw in there were um, unauthorized or not specifically authorized uh, purchases or morale events or, or things like that. And I labeled that the don't do it zone. If it doesn't feel right and it's not accomplishing the mission, don't do it. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, that upper right quadrant, this is what I call the leadership zone, where you are making decisions that are not clearly covered by policy, but they've got a high positive yield. And I really think that's what the essence of leadership is. It's about being empowered to make decisions that are not clearly articulated by uh, policy or by pre-mission planning, but that are within the ballpark of what your assignment is given given your position and your role within the organization. Those are uncomfortable decisions. And as you stray farther from that clear guidance, as you get further along that horizontal axis, I made a little space for that's where you call the boss. In those high yield, but very far afield of guidance decisions, calling for uh, alignment for guidance, for advice. I think that's really what that space is reserved for. And that's what that role is reserved for. But on the, you know, also within that quadrant is spaces where you don't need to call your boss. 
where it is on you as a leader to make those decisions on your own and to make the right ones. Yeah, that's very well articulated. Yeah, thanks for for that. So I was uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, doing this episode, I wanted all three of you. Um, Nick, Lieutenant Jabs couldn't come today. I was going to have each of you maybe ask the others a question or or make a comment about the other articles. So I don't know if that's going to work with the, just the two of you, but you guys are on the same pier, which is I think a, a great coincidence that your your uh, ships are on the same pier out there in San Francisco, but. Um, I'll start with Drew. Any any thoughts uh, for what Matt wrote? Any um, you know uh, did that did that uh, echo with you? Did you face you know similar things in your you know early Jo days, um, or or did you have a question maybe for Matt? Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, I thought both both Matt and Nick's articles were phenomenal, very insightful. Um, it's it is um, a very brave thing to make yourself vulnerable and 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 share uh, a. Uh, potentially a story where you felt um, scared or a, a growth moment. Those are, those are hard stories to tell. Um, and I, I did really like the awareness that it brought Matt there. So I think my main question is um, instead of having one of those moments that uh, is a learning moment, like how do you see um, the Coast Guard, the uh, sea services training that into our junior leaders, into our people, um, where can we teach that when to call the boss moment um, so that that can be shared instead of learned? Well, I think something that is a service we do so well, and I'm always so proud of it when I get the chance to talk about the Coast Guard with international audiences or with uh, folks from other services is that we really empower our junior folks, especially our junior enlisted members. And, and I think the side that most folks err on is being overly eager to reach back to home plate to, to call the boss. I, I know in that moment, that was what my instinct was telling me to do. And, and I think it really comes from uh, the command climate and, and the way that our leadership team works with the rest of the crew in order to create that uh create those circumstances where folks feel comfortable and feel empowered uh taking that responsibility for themselves and that's really what leadership is it's about owning your decision it's about uh not passing it up the chain of command not passing it to somebody else but but planting your feet and making a decision and sticking with it and, and i think uh, Commander Stafford, your your article reminded me exactly of that. As I was going through it, I remembered thinking, you know, it wasn't that long ago that that I was an operations officer on a cutter. I was a, a deck watch officer in my first tour, and, and I think it must be such a, a great thing for for your crew when they take the chance to read your article to to see how high of a regard you hold them in, and the fact that you uh, expect them to be leaders in their own right, to be experts in their craft, to be um, to be decision makers and to be influential on your crew. I really think that's what it comes down to. If leadership can be distilled into just one piece, it's, it's the way that you inspire your crew. It's how things run when you're not on the bridge, when you're not in the engine room, when you're not uh, watching what people are doing, listening to what they're saying, but confident nonetheless that they are doing things the right way, that they're doing things as professionals, that they're doing things as mariners, that they're uh, representing the Coast Guard in, in the best way. And I'm, I'm sure as everybody on your crew has, has read that article, they they know what you're expecting of them, and I'm sure they're eager to uh, achieve it for you. Oh, thank you. And I, I do think what you were talking about when it comes to, um, you know, the, the trusting your gut and allowing that space, I do think for all of us in leadership roles, whether that's the commanding officer or elsewhere, um, allowing your people to have that space to make that decision to operate that, whether it's it's your bosses back at home port giving you that space to, to make those on-scene decisions or whether that's us on the ship allowing our people to make decisions, uh, that, is a, that is a big growth point in allowing space for people to, to test their leadership abilities. I, I want to make a point, uh, and I, I tell this to everybody I know uh, in the Navy or who served with me in the Navy. Uh, I, I did not have a lot of interaction with the Coast Guard during my Navy career, and I think that's a very common thing. 
Um, and the Navy, you know, sort of sees the Coast Guard as, uh, you know, it's, it's something small, it's different, it's, you know, um, our little brother, maybe that kind of thing. Um, and, and since retiring and, and being at the Naval Institute and working with a lot of Coast Guard authors, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One is uh, the Coast Guard punches above its weight in our magazine. Uh, so for the smallest service, we get proportionally a much higher number of uh, proceedings articles from, from Coasties than we do from the other services. The second thing I'll point out is when I was a JO in the Navy, um, there was a, a, a common saying, which was command early, command often. Right. And I know a lot of Coast Guard or not a, a lot of uh, Navy officers that I served with back in the 80s who came out of the Navy of, uh, you know, Korean War, Vietnam War uh, era and into the Cold War. They they had opportunities to command as a lieutenant and a lieutenant commander and then a commander and, and so on. Uh, but the Navy's really gotten away from that. We have very few, very, very few uh, early command opportunities. Uh, but the Coast Guard has a ton of them. And so. The Coast Guard, I think you guys, you you it, you live that. You command early, you command off, and you command all the time. Uh, so, uh, and I'm also always telling uh, our our Navy folks, uh, anyone who will listen, that the Coast Guard's got some very impressive shipbuilding programs going on right now. Mm -hmm. I think the NSCs are great ships. The OPCs that are coming online and the FRCs are amazing ships. I don't understand why the Navy doesn't just, you know, keep those uh, production lines going. Uh, buy some of each and upgun them and, you know, put some harpoons or some, uh, you know, Tomahawk uh, anti-ship cruise missiles or other things on them. But I think there, we could upgun them and we could build the Navy fleet pretty quickly and pretty inexpensively. I'll get off my my hobby horse now, but that that is, uh, uh, you know, a couple of things that, that I tell Navy folks all the time is Coast Guard's building some great ships and and they actually do the command early, command often thing. So for our non, really for the non-Coast Guard audience, um, you know, you guys have both had command. Nick Jabs has had command. Uh, thoughts on the impact of, you know, young officers of having command in your 20s. Uh, fun, exciting, daunting, frightening, you know, all the above. I'll start with Drew. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I, I think you you spoke very well there um, to the to the Coast Guard. Um, it's a it's an exciting time to be in the Coast Guard, and it's, it's an exciting time to be uh, afloat in the Coast Guard with uh, new ships coming online, with with you know some very exciting operations that we do. Uh, when it when it comes to command, um, it is a very daunting task, especially especially early in your career. Uh, but it's also exciting. I think that is where I grew the most as a, as a person um, is in those when you're, when you're having to make those decisions uh, when you're running that team. Um, but also just when it comes to like development of Coast Guard officers or development of, of Coasties in general, those, those commands and having a diverse group of people uh, in those commands level jobs, whether that's an officer in charge as a senior enlisted, whether that's a warrant officer, whether that's a, a junior officer, um, developing those command skills is going to just create better commanding officers uh, as senior officers. So if you can, just like anything else, if you can practice uh, being a commanding officer by having those roles early in your career, that's going to let you develop those skills for when you're having you know, a larger ship, larger impact. Uh, later on in your career. So I, I do believe um, it's also an important developmental tool uh, to building Coast Guard officers of the future. Awesome. Uh, Matt, how about you? And, and I would piggyback on that. I would backtrack to say, I think if we want to put the uh, harpoons on the buoy tender, I think that that's, uh, who knows? <laughs> you never know what's going to happen uh, out there. So I, I don't know if we've got anybody listening who is, uh, who's making those kinds of calls. Maybe that's, maybe that's where the Coast Guard needs to go. I don't know, but uh, I'm kidding. But uh, certainly I think the, the junior command within the Coast Guard, um, it, it has a huge impact. When I think about uh, my mentors, the, the people who trained me uh, to be the, the ship driver and the leader that I am today, uh, almost all of them had had prior command experience, people who were leading me at all sorts of different levels within the organization. The thing that they shared uh, was that they were able to get command experience earlier in their career. And not only did that benefit me because of their knowledge, but they were pretty clear that when they were training me and all of the people that I grew up in the Coast Guard learning how to drive boats with, 
we are all working towards our command assignments, working towards uh, those assignments where we own the problem. There's nobody else coming to uh, to take responsibility for it. It's going to be on us. And as a, a junior officer just out of the academy, that was a really daunting thing to hear, but it was a very true thing to hear. And it lays down a marker for what we are trying to accomplish when we take a group of ensigns or we take a group of uh, break in deck watch officers, first class petty officers, chief petty officers. What we are really training each and every one of them for is for command, if not in their next assignment, then in the assignments to follow. And that creates uh, a real urgency to the training that we do and to uh, really everything that we do as a service. Awesome. Um, real quick, because we're running short on time, but uh, if, if either of you could give advice to uh, uh, Cadet Stafford or Cadet Nagel, uh, looking back at, at yourself as uh, you know, you know, Coast Guard Academy cadets uh, as you were embarking on your career, um, what would you tell the younger version of yourself? I'll start with uh, Drew. Oh, uh, thanks. I I think my biggest thing, uh, especially for for people newly joining the service, uh, new ensigns especially, is don't underestimate your impact that you can have. Um, you know. People get so wrapped up in kind of the the imposter syndrome of it, where they're not a technical expert yet. They are still leaning on everybody to learn their main job of whether that's ship handling, whether that's their whatever their divisional roles are, um, and they they tie that with leadership. But those can be two different things. Like being a good leader, being a good supervisor, and having an impact on the crew. Um, while being a technical expert helps, those are not tied together. You can still be a good supervisor. You can still be a good leader uh, while learning how to be a technical expert. So don't don't underestimate the impact you can have. I mean, it doesn't take much to learn about tuition assistance and then start sharing that with the crew. And now all of a sudden you're having an impact because people are getting their college paid for um, or whatever those little things are. You can find places where you can have immediate impacts um, as well as being a good leader and a good supervisor. So I think that's my main point is, is don't underestimate the impact that you can have um, on a unit and, and seek out those things and find those opportunities where you can be a, a benefit to the crew. Yeah, that's a great point, Matt. I think it's so important to let yourself be a novice and, and to be gentle with yourself as you're developing as a, an officer and a leader. I can remember the the first time I was uh, driving Coast Guard Cutter Monroe on my first ship. Uh, we were getting ready to make a big turn to starboard coming into San Diego. It's uh, you know the, the big uh, fish hook that you do as you're coming in there. And I gave a, a command of left, left standard rudder if you were making that turn and everybody on the bridge looked at me and I felt so stupid and I felt like I had made a big mistake and I was, I was terrible at ship driving. I was never going to get good at it. And it wasn't until I, I gave myself a little bit of patience and kind of let myself off the hook and said, you know, you're going to be bad at this. You're learning, you're new and you're going to grow. And that, that ultimately I was able to calm down, improve my skills and, and ultimately, uh, become uh, become a professional ship driver and a professional mariner uh, that's a that's a great point let yourself be a novice because you you are one when you when you first start out and, and that's okay it's it's designed by design that way right well that's about all the time we have for today this has been a great conversation my guests have been uh, two of the winners of our 2023 leadership essay contest lieutenant matt nagel and lieutenant commander drew stafford u.s coast guard uh, and they're, they're, um, the second prize winner, Lieutenant Nick Jabs, his article also, uh, fantastic articles on leadership. They appeared in the May, June, and July issues of Proceedings. You can find them under the Leadership Forum tab. Guys, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you thanks. for having us. Okay, this episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. If you're not, please consider becoming one by going to usni.org join. Our members are the foundation for everything we do, from USNI news to proceedings to naval history, 
our books and our conferences and events. They're the foundation of what we are and what we do. So please become a member today. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.